Greetings, everyone. Uh, welcome to the session. My name is Minakshi Kaushik, and I work in Cisco's Emerging Technology and Incubation Unit called Outshift. And today I'm going to talk about how you can use existing Kubernetes tools to jumpstart your large language model security. So the agenda for today's session is as follows. I'm going to start by taking a look at why Gen AI security is important, and then at a very high level talk about large language model security challenges, prevention and mitigation techniques, and spend most uh, part of my talk looking at prompt and response security in Kubernetes and demo. So let's start by taking a look at why Gen AI security is important. This is the survey which was done by Cisco's AI Readiness Index team, and they found that 61% of enterprises plan to deploy AI application in next year. So there are going to be a lot of AI application in the market. However, only 14% of these enterprises feel that they are fully prepared. So uh, one of the reasons why that is the case is security for large language models. So large language model gen AI is more uh, has more security issues. And there are three main reasons why. One, it's new. Two, it's rapidly evolving. And three is that the existing application security measures do not address all the unique challenges of large language model. So what are some of these uh, unique challenges of large language model. So the first thing is that in the traditional application security, uh, the request response is pretty structured. So I can ask, give me the uh, all my Kubernetes cluster. And my security and identity would know that it's me and only provide access to my Kubernetes cluster. However, with large language model, you have to convert this natural language into something which your identity and security can understand. The second is that the data flow in the, uh, the traditional application is always from the database to the user. So for example, you can, uh, the same example of provide me all, uh, all my Kubernetes cluster, the data is flowing from the Kubernetes database to me. However, with large language model, the data flows both ways. So in the prompt, I can actually scrape some Kubernetes data from somewhere and ask my large language model, can you provide me more info? So the security infrastructure has to be able to really take into account this two-way uh, data flow. And then the third is that the blast radius of large language models is pretty large. So, um, the, uh, so these uh, adversarial machine learning vulnerabilities which uh, are present are very neatly captured and prioritized in OWASP top 10 large language models. And uh, in this presentation, I'm going to really focus on uh, the deployment as well as the operation and the maintenance aspect of these top 10 large language model. So broadly, they are classified into prompt and res uh, response security issues, um, large, uh, large language model plugin, uh, plugin issues, the design issues, and supply chain issues. We are going to take a look deeper look into all this uh, uh, in the rest of the presentation. But what I also want to point out is that enterprises may not own all the components of this uh, large language model. And um, no matter which deployment strategy which the enterprises use, they uh, most probably should be able to deploy prompt and response security. And that's why I'm going to focus more on the prompt and the response security. For the next four slides, all I want you to focus on is the red bar which I have, which shows the enterprise boundary and see where uh, the prompt response security is something which an enterprise can enforce. So if the enterprise is consuming large language model as a service, whether they are consuming a large language model as a service and they have their enterprise plugins, they, are uh, they, they actually build their own large language model, for example, or um, they are the provider of large language model as a service. So what are some of these common prompt response security issues? Uh, they are hallucination and uh, relevance, data leakage, toxicity, jailbreak, and prompt injections. And we will take a, a deeper look as presentation goes on. So what are some of the uh, uh, prevention and mitigation techniques? So this, uh, the prevention and mitigation techniques are also very well captured by the OWASP top 10 LLM. And uh, so for example, if you look at uh, the large language model supply chain, 
Today, we already do software bill of materials. We also do workload security. For example, we look at Kubernetes context. With large language model, we, uh, we add like a AI software bill of material, which would include model and data lineage, and uh, also uh, look at the LLM security for each of the plugins. Then for prompt and response, uh, in API security, we already do sensitive data detection. We also look at shadow APIs. And with large language model, we would extend that, for example, for uh, the API security for the plugins. Uh, the identity which I talked about should be able to know the natural language and figure out what identity it is and apply. And all the different things which I talked about in prompt response, hallucinations, et cetera. With model denial of service, uh, we already do API rate limits. We do input, uh, input output validation. Now we need to fo uh, add something which is model focus. So basically, how many number of actions a prompt generates, for example? What is the context window size? Or for example, um, uh, uh, things like uh, you know, uh, the, the use for uh, the, the resources which are used for the prompt. So these are um, some of the prevention and mitigation techniques. Like I said, I wanted to give a high level overview before I focus on how would we do this in Kubernetes. So um, one way and the easy way would be to front end the large language model deployment with large language model security gateway. And uh, if we look uh, further down into the large language model security gateway, um, ideally, you would want in the blue uh, box where I have enterprise large language model application, you want to have a large language model application that front ends talking to uh, the actual large language model because it can provide you a way to normalize uh, to different uh, large language models. You can do some form of prompt engineering at this point of time. For example, maintain session tables, you can maintain caches. And uh, so now the user will ta talk to this enterprise large language model application. So there are three broad uh, security things you can do. Something uh, uh, you can do the identity and access management at the ingress. You can look at the prompt request and responses, uh, uh, filter prompt res request and responses at the egress, and then perform prompt response uh, and security. So the First one, which is the identity, is something which we already do with traditional applications. We, uh, I talked about give me all my Kubernetes cluster, you look at the identity and then decide who has access to what. You would just need to extend it to uh, the large language model where you would break down the prompt into actions which your identity can understand and then apply the access and see if the user has access to the question that it is asking. And then after it flows into the enterprise response is something new which we haven't seen before. So in my demo, I'm actually focusing, starting from uh, the fact that you are already augmenting your identity. And then uh, when we reach the enterprise large language model application, what kind of filtering we can do to get the request and response and then uh, perform the request response security. So um, the, um, I am using uh, the existing Kubernetes tool, so Kubernetes and Istio, and uh, the, uh, the sleep pod, which is always uh, present in the Istio, to actually uh, represent the enterprise large language model uh, application. And now um, uh, I'm using the e in Istio egress gateway uh, for uh, trying, to, uh, trying to get uh, the request response. So have an envoy filter in egress gateway so that it can pick up request response and we can do processing in this LLM uh, prompt monitor. Now, I didn't need the three gateways, but it is kind of nice to have a, uh, one, gateway, uh, uh, one gateway per large language model. The reason is because uh, this is a proxy. Egress gateway also acts as a proxy. And different large language models may need a different kind of uh, uh, packets uh, for proxying. For example, with ChatGPT, as you know, you, uh, you use bearer token, whereas with Azure OpenAI, you use API keys, and with Llama, there is, uh, uh, you just simply use TLS. And so it makes like uh, your filter design pretty straightforward. So what would happen is that the enterprise uh, app would then take the request, 
uh, pass it to the uh, egress gateway, making the decision as to which la large language model it wants to process it to. The egress gateway has a filter, and the filter will send the, uh, the, uh, it to the large language model where we would make a decision if it, the prompt is good. If the prompt is not good, then it directly tells the user, oh, um, you know, for example, malicious prompt detected. Otherwise, it sends it to uh, a, one of these large language model. The response comes back. And then the response again goes into the processing input. And uh, you can then uh, do response processing or keep a cache of prompt and response so that you can do prompt response processing and then send it back to the large language model. So let's uh, see this in action in my Kubernetes cluster. I'm jumping a little bit back and forth, but uh, so this is my Kubernetes cluster. And it, um, as you can see, this uh, sleep pod actually simulates uh, what I talked about, an enterprise application. I have a very simple Istio deployment, which uh, has a Istio daemon ingress and egress gateway. And uh, the, I, uh, as I mentioned, I'm using three egress gateways. You don't have to. So one uh, going to Azure, one going to Chat GPT, and the other going into Llama. And uh, before uh, the egress gateway uh, looks at the request and sends it to, for example, large language prompt monitor. So now let's look at the uh, Envoy gateway, which, uh, uh, which a simple gateway that you can write on your egress to perform this uh, proxy function as well as taking uh, the request and the response, right? So this is a simple um, Envoy filter uh, written in Lua. And uh, you can, uh, as you can see that, uh, as I was mentioning, because it is Azure AI, uh, Azure AI so you're using an API key to build the, uh, the, the proxy. And uh, also, uh, before the request is forwarded to the large language model, uh, for every request, it actually passes to the large language uh, prompt monitor service. And then based on the response of the uh, large language prompt monitor service, if it is not equal to 200, then um, in, in the case of large language model, I'm detecting like a prompt, uh, prompt injection error, so it shows that it, malicious prompt is detected. So you could like uh, write a simple Lua filter for your egress uh, filter monitoring to do that. And similar thing you can do for response. Like for example, all the responses also go to the large language monitor service. So with that, uh, yeah, with that, let's like uh, see, uh, uh, write some prompts and see what happens. So I'm going to look at the logs of the log monitor service, and um, let me just do go and. So here, like for example, I can um, I can um, I can just say, teach me how to steal a car. Something which 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 we shouldn't do. But if I said, uh, teach, uh, teach me how to, st uh, how to steal a car, it actually says um, that it's a malicious prompt detected. So if I go back to my log file, you can see that it comes to teach me how to steal a car uh, in my monitoring service because my Envoy filter passes to this monitoring service. And then um, I'm going to talk a little bit more. Uh, there are a lot of libraries available to detect hallucination, prompt injection, data leakage, like for example, rebuff or uh, true error, or uh, I'm using Ylogs because I took a deep learning course and uh, they were using Ylogs. And I, I like because uh, they have written wrappers around standard libraries which show good visualization as you would see. And so um, uh, this, is, uh, this is the Ylogs uh, li uh, library which uh, just quickly checks if uh, there is a prompt uh, injection detected and it says yes it is. And so it passes like 400 response. And if you remember in our Lua filter, we said, if, oh, if it's not 200, then I'm not going to pass to the large language model, but would say malicious prompt is detected. So um, now let's try to see a good prompt. Uh, and so for example, I can say, um, for example, say hello in Hindi. And so this is a good prompt. And so it goes all the way to the Azure AI uh, uh, in this uh, example. And then you can see that uh, I got a response back, which here. So the answer is namaste, which is, which is a response. And so if we go back to our uh, monitoring service, 
um, as you can see that uh, it, uh, it got this prompt. And then it again, uh, this is a very simple libraries which are uh, wrappers around some standard libraries which are available, which looks for prompt injection. And it didn't see any issues, so it sent 200. And that allowed the filter to go to the backend. And uh, uh, then the backend uh, did the response. So this is how uh, you could like uh, start with uh, enabling large language model security. So what additional things, or how do we actually detect these prompt uh, uh, request response issues? So with, for that, I'm going to uh, take a look at three slides and then go back to Collab to show more. It's easier to actually show that in Collab. As I said, um, I took this deep learning course and uh, it was, uh, um, the y, uh, y Labs was uh, the company which was uh, talking about it. So there is, uh, this material is really taken from there, but it's very relevant to just think about how we look at hallucination and relevance detection. So the way to look at hallucination and relevance detection is that you could look at either a comparison of prompt and response, or you can uh, ask your large language model the same question multiple times and then can compare between those multiple responses. So those are like two ways. I'm not saying these are the only ways. I'm just saying that uh, these are like some of the ideas. And depending on your data set, the kind of analysis that you do may work or may not work. So for example, for uh, the, uh, the uh, detecting whether, uh, when you're detecting between the similarity between the prompt and the response, the first thing you can do is you can just compare tokens. So, uh, and which is what the blue score does. And then uh, it, if, uh, if that doesn't give you the uh, good results, then what you can do is you can compare embeddings. And so you can compare contextual word embeddings and then look at like cement, semantic match, which is what BERT does. So it, it is like better than just looking at word, but it is actually looking at contextual embeddings. And that might work for the prompt and the responses which are flowing through your enterprise. Then uh, for the, for you're asking the question to the large language model and getting response one, response two, response three, then you are actually doing some sentence comparison. So you are doing response one uh, sentence com comparison to two to three. And so instead of doing word comparison, which you were doing with request and response, you're doing complete sentence embedding comparison. And then you can use different kinds of similarities. You can use cosine similarity, which is what the first one is, or you can actually send it to another large language model to say, oh, I'm giving you these embeddings, how similar they are. So this is, uh, these are some of the ways that uh, you can detect uh, hallucination and relevance. Um, for data leakage, this is some standard stuff. Uh, you know, all products do it in API security. And so really what you do is uh, you can use either like standard libraries to match all this personally identifiable data, or you can write a simple RNN model or something to do pattern matching. And the same is the case with toxicity. Uh, you might want to do more than that because your large language model may leak, like for example, your product name, your project names, your employee name. And so you want to do entity recognition. So there are standard libraries available for entity recognition as well. And then um, this is like even more hand wavy, but uh, when you look at the example, it would make a little bit more sense. But uh, the, for uh, jailbreak and prompt injection detection, uh, for example. So jailbreak is where, um, you know, usually the large language model would say uh, uh, how to steal a car, and they would say, I'm sorry, I can't give you this information. You shouldn't do this. And then um, you are able to, like, uh, craft an input and still get some ideas from the large language model. So you are able to break the jail which uh, the uh, large language uh, model has done. And so one of the ways you can do that is with prompt text length. And then uh, for the prompt injection, you can look at similarities between the usual prompts. So now let's take a look at the example. Like I said, this was uh, part of like uh, the sample prompted responses were part from the deep learning course, which I took with quality and safety for large language model. And the libraries I'm using are Y Labs, but you know, there are many open source libraries available. So really the data set consists of prompts and responses. And so they are not perfect prompts and responses. They have some of these hallucination jailbreaks. And this is like the full text of the prompt and responses. So let's look at hallucination. We talked about this blue score where we are looking at token similarity between the request and the response. 
So as you can see that when you look at the token similarity between request and response, at least for the data set that uh, I have, it, uh, it's clubbing everything together. So it's not really too much of a help. And the reason why it's not too much of a help is because all the samples which are prompt and responses don't really have too much in common. So like for example, can you give me credit card information? It says I'm unable to provide anything of that subject. So there isn't any um, comp uh, tokens which are common between the prompt and responses, for example. So this is what you won't be, uh, so this is not a really good uh, metrics for, like, for this data set. Then you can uh, start looking at BERT score, where I was talking about where you do contextual embedding matches. And so you can see with the BERT score, there is a little bit of stagger, it is able to do that. So it looks like a better fit, this metrics looks like a better fit. And um, as, uh, as you can see that the, con uh, the contextual ma mapping doesn't match too well when there is a single response or a single, a single word in the prompt because you can't really uh, do contextual matching here. And so it tells you, oh, this must be a hallucination, for example. Then um, the other, other thing which I talked about was where you compare response one versus response two versus response three, and then see how similar they are. And so you are looking at these responses and seeing the similarity score. In this example, it doesn't make much of a difference because when you are asking the large language model multiple times, um, they, it, it is providing uh, similar scores. But uh, for certain uh, topics, like for example, uh, the, uh, so as you can see, most of them provide similar responses, but then, then there are some, some which don't, and those are the ones where you have all the refusals. Sorry, I'm unable to provide you this, and then you tell, uh, tell it, tell me how to hotwire a car, uh, or uh, ask it for some detailed explanation. So then the large language model starts giving different responses for those, and that's why it would detect it as hallucination. So, so similarly, we talked about uh, data leakage and toxicity. As I said, there are standard PII libraries available, and then you can detect, oh, uh, what are the different kinds of like phone, mailing address, all, all, all that kind of stuff, both on the request and the response, now that you are already passing to your monitoring service. And uh, the, so, so it, it shows what kind of detection it has between the prompt and responses. And then, as I was talking about, you may want to know more than PII information. So you, you may want to know entity recognition, for example. And uh, that you can do using this uh, library called Span uh, Maker Model. And uh, uh, it will be, and you have to really tell, like, what is entity for your uh, particular uh, thing? Like, for example, in this case, it's person, product, and organization. So you have to identify what what you think is uh, the entity you are worried about, and then it is able to tell you what issues it has. And uh, similarly with toxicity, there is like a tox uh, toxigen hate bird uh, model which you can use uh, for, uh, for analysis of toxicity. And uh, the jailbreak which I was talking about, there is a site called uh, Jailbreak Chat uh, which actually talks about how you can jailbreak and most of the time you can jailbreak is when you tell chat GPT, oh, pretend that you are something, and now tell me how I can steal the car. Or imagine you are having conversation with two people and uh, do uh, something about it. And so, the, so then, and, and in that context, the, uh, to, tell, uh, to tell chat GPT or uh, any, any large language model this, you might have to describe a, a little bit larger and so you can see how it makes sense to say, okay, I'll look at the prompt text length, but this may not work, but uh, you know, uh, it could be one measure. And uh, these measurements are always evolving, but I wanted to give an idea of like, how you can jumpstart uh, this. And for injection similarity, uh, prompt injection similarity, you would use uh, similar, um, you, know, you would still use similarity matches between the common phrases which create prompt injection. Like for example, your new task is, you are an actor who is role playing. And so like in my example, it was like, teach me how to uh, steal a car. So you can add teach uh, anything which has something with similarity to teach uh, is a prompt injection. And so that's how you would detect prompt injection. So with that, um, I'm almost to the end of my presentation where I was going to say that you can use uh, existing Kubernetes tools to jumpstart your uh, large language model security. And uh, thank you for coming for this session. 
And I think I have time to take questions. Five minutes. Hi. I will compare the reality between the experiment and the actual real market in the experiment. How do you do that? Um, uh, is the question that when you are comparing sentences, uh, what are you doing? Oh, okay, so there are libraries available where you can uh, look at the, uh, and this is why I was talking about the Vilox uh, uh, and other uh, open source. Uh, they are not completely open source, they have open source and closed source, and that you can do, and you can look at their embeddings. And so once you have the embeddings, then you can look at the similarity between the embeddings of the sentences and to see how similar they are. So the, uh, in uh, this session, I talked about two things, that you can look at the cosine similarity between them, or you can feed those embeddings to the large language model and ask them, oh, if they are similar or not similar. Are there any other questions? Uh, uh, sorry. Uh. So you said you would you could filter out on anything really using the verb as teach as an injection. Yeah. But you could also use that as a non-injection. Exactly. So so parsing out that whole thing is important. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, so this is a very uh, great point, which is basically teach me how to steal a car could also be teach me something good, like you know, teach me uh, about Kubernetes, for example. And so you have to parse out what is, uh, what is different about that teach. I 100% agree. And so there are a lot of uh, these libraries which are evolving just to do that. In fact, like uh, even at Cisco, we are looking at uh, open sourcing some of these libraries. Uh, and so th th these are not perfect, as you can see. Um, and you have to like fine tune it to make it work for your environment. Any other questions? Yeah, I would compare it to the other way around. It's more like saying in Spanish, it's more like um, a teaching than an evaluation. That's okay. Can you compare two LLM models and say which one is more efficient or more trustworthy? Uh, the question is, can you compare two LLM models and say which one is more efficient for your environment? Um, the I mean, uh, if in, in the context of this presentation, you could uh, look at all these metrics to like do the comparison. But I would say that if you had to go back from the fundamentals, you would want to like start with model cards to see how, uh, how they were created and then uh, see whether uh, they map for your environment. Like for example, uh, the custom LLMs, what data was used and uh, how they were fine tuned. Uh, that's the first thing that you want to look at to see whether they fit for the purpose that you're doing. Like for example, in uh, my team, we are looking for generating uh, remediation code. So you want to like uh, look which large language model, how it has been fine-tuned to um, uh, 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 fi uh, fine-tuned for that purpose. That will be the first. Then the second is that after you have selected the best model, which is what I didn't talk about here, and I was I only talked about once you have selected whatever is best uh, best given the model cards and all the data that you have, then you deploy it in production and uh, then look at the request and the responses. My talk was focused on security. Um, and that could be one, uh, one lever which you use for which large language model is better, like which one is more secure, whether um, uh, it allows you to do jailbreaks, whether all the things which I was saying you should do it in your gateway, whether the large language model does it already as a guardrails for uh, their capability. So then it is better because they are itself providing some kind of guardrail. So security could be one measure to compare whether large language model is better. But you can also look at performance, you could look at the speed and uh, all the other aspects. So I guess uh, it would, uh, uh, to compare to large language models, you have to first decide on what, is the, what are different criterias that 
makes it better for uh, for you. And so it could be the size because uh, you know deploying uh, uh, takes. Uh, uh, I mean, I have so much issues getting GPUs at my work <laughs> uh, because uh, these sizes are pretty large. So. Um, it, you could you could start by uh, looking at size. You can look at whether it fits the data set that which you are looking at. You could be looking at security. You could be looking at performance. And then once you have all these criteria and have the score, then you can make a decision as to which large language model is better or not better. So um, security is just one aspect of it. So I think, yeah, hi, uh, I, I, I think I've, uh, I've run out of time, but I'm happy to talk to you after the session. So thank you so much for coming, everyone. Thanks.